Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our to our modcast series entitled The State of MOGAD Research from a Therapeutic Perspective. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Benjamin Greenberg from UT Southwestern. My name is Peter Fontanez, Executive Board Member and Director of the MOGAD Resources and Advocacy at the MOG Project. I am the caretaker of my daughter, who is a MOGAD patient. The MOG Project is a U.S.-based nonprofit organization devoted to raising awareness, advancing research, and providing support and advocacy for the MOGAD community in hopes of finding a cure. We would like to thank Dr. Greenberg and the MOG Squad for their contributions to this podcast. The podcast is being recorded and will be available on our website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel. If you want to submit questions, please feel free to do so uh, by commenting on our Facebook Live video. We will be answering community questions, time permitting, and answer any unanswered questions. We will be answered in the follow-up MOG blog, so stay tuned. Uh, just to let you guys know, we are live currently on Facebook. Dr. Um, here I'll be introducing Dr. Benjamin Greenberg. Um, he is a professor of neurology at the UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. TED Texas. He directs the Perot Neuroscience Transitional, Translational Research Center with the O'Donnell Brain Institute and the Conquer Program, which is a collaborative clinical research program focused on the needs of adults and children with neuroimmunolo neuroimmunological disorders. Welcome, Dr. Greenberg. We are happy to have you here today with us. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here with you. So Dr. Greenberg, um, so we're going to be talking about the first topic is going to be about selective depletion of antigen specific antibodies for the treatment of demyelinating disease. Um, can you please explain from a therapeutic perspective where MAGAD research currently stands? What are some of the strategies that are being explored that target the MOG antibody specifically? So it's a great question, Peter. And as you know, right now we use a lot of therapies in what's considered off-label prescribing because there's nothing that's specifically FDA approved for anti-MOG associated disorder. And the therapies we use are meant to prevent future attacks that are uh, you know, individuals diagnosed with this condition or our loved ones who are diagnosed with this condition may suffer from. One of the strategies we're trying to develop is a way to get rid of the anti-MOG antibody while leaving the rest of the immune system intact. So instead of taking a broad immunosuppressant medication or a medicine that broadly impacts the immune system, is there a way to surgically remove that single confused antibody uh, while maintaining a healthy immune system otherwise? We published a paper here out of UT Southwestern several years ago where there was a technology developed and tested in an animal model of disease where we showed you could selectively remove that antibody and leave the immune system intact. And the way it worked was by tagging the antibody for destruction within the human body. So whenever we make antibodies, these proteins, they get recycled. Uh, they don't live forever, and you have to replenish that supply over time. And there is a system within all of our cells that absorbs antibodies and then degrades them. Wouldn't it be great if we could tell the body to specifically degrade the anti-MOG antibody? And that's essentially what we did in the study. And so this is work that was led uh, in a lab by a researcher, Sally Ward, um, and there are currently discussions with a lot of different groups on how can we move it out of animals and ultimately into a drug that was developed for humans. That is awesome. That, that is incredible to hear some uh, that that's in the works. Um, we know that tolerization is, is a current buzzword circulating around the community, and we would like to know what specific methods of tolerization are being explored to target the MOG antibody. Can you break down the different, uh, different types, explaining in layman's terms how they would work to do, uh, to do the selective depletion of the MOG antibody? I, I guess you kind of went over some of that before. Well, I, I did, but it, it gets into a great topic that can be very confusing, this notion of tolerization. What is it? How do we achieve it? And so let's take a step back and talk about what goes wrong in an autoimmune disease. And we're going to start by talking about normal biology. So we all have an immune system, billions of cells that are programmed to search out invading infections and to fight off those infections, viruses and bacteria. And so these cells, you can think of it as a whole army, they have to go through basic training. And that you have to make sure that your soldiers are only going to shoot at uh, the enemy and not friendly fired. Worst thing in the world is to have a confused military 
firing at itself or firing on your own capital, the one that it's supposed to be protecting. So in tolerization, there are two steps, what's called central and peripheral tolerance. And you can think of this as kind of an exam at the end of basic training and an exam at the end of paratrooper training. And you have to pass both exams in order to make it out into the active military. For people with autoimmune diseases, one of those exams failed. It failed to recognize that soldier A couldn't tell the difference between the Capitol building or a car on the road and a tank coming in and just fires at the car on the road. And so tolerance, essentially the loss of tolerance is a failure to kick those recruits out of the military. And so one of the things that we're trying to do scientifically is fix tolerance. Could you get your own body to find all of those uh, confused soldiers and either retrain them or tell them, you know what, your help's not needed, thanks, but no thanks. And there are a lot of different strategies that are being explored uh, to do this. There are ways that you can increase your educational programming. There are ways that you can support the, the regulatory cells, the cells that are uh, dampening down the overactive immune system. Lots of different strategies are underway. Um, in the end, we separate tolerance therapies into two categories. Here, and here's what's practically important for our friends and families who are dealing with anti mog associated disorder. Um, the question I get all the time in clinic about tolerance is, Dr. Greenberg, is there a treatment I can take once that will completely cure my immune system of those confused soldiers and be done with it? That's essentially a cure for the disease. That would be an approach around central tolerance, very upfront, the basic training, don't let anybody through who's confused, and can we re reorganize the immune system through a, a single intervention. The second group of interventions around peripheral tolerance are, listen, some confused soldiers are getting through, but can we give you a non-immunosuppressive therapy to keep them from acting on that confusion? Can we suppress them somehow? And both of these strategies are being studied. Admittedly, there's more strategies around peripheral tolerance. The example I gave of getting rid of the confused antibody is a treatment that somebody would have to take over and over and over and over again because we didn't solve for the basic training. Those, those confused cells still get through, so we're dealing with ways to dampen down their activity. The holy grail is to fix the central tolerance issue, is to make it so that the confused cell never gets developed to begin with. That is an incredible analogy that really puts it down in uh, terms that, that that is a lot simpler to understand. Um, th uh, thank you for that. Uh, what would you, what would patients expect if tolerization works? Would patients expect to be on medicine for life or could it be a possible, could it be possible to cure the disease with one or, or a few treatments? Yes, and this gets to that notion of the, the peripheral and the central. So I think what we're gonna see first are treatments that are not immunosuppressive, so they don't come with the risk of infections or cancers or things like that, which is wonderful, that induce uh, peripheral tolerance, but require repeated dosing. So lots of advantages over what we have now, a definite improvement, a definite move in the right direction. Um, and depending on your definition of cure, you can decide is it curative or not. Um, a lot of my patients say, no, 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 no. A cure is a one-time treatment and then I'm done. Well, we're not going to get there yet. That The first step is going to be in between, something that requires multiple treatments over time to maintain that benefit. But in the future, we will have that cure where we can do a one-time treatment and get rid of those confused cells once and for all. There are multiple strategies being explored to do that. That's great to hear because having a daughter with this, knowing that the that the, the there's a potential for a treatment like that in the future would is huge. Um, so, so I know that she'll have a good future ahead of her. How close are researchers to achieving the goal of the of a clinical trial and tolerization for patients? So the good news is clinical trials of tolerization have already begun, just not in MOG. And and here's what it's important for the community to recognize. When it comes to autoimmune diseases, they can be separated, they can be classified 
by two parameters and only two parameters, all autoimmune diseases. So if I go back to that military analogy, the first uh, characteristic that characterizes all autoimmune diseases is which part of the military got confused? The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, where, where's the root of the confusion? In immune cell terms, is it the T cell, the B cell? What, what part of the immune system got confused? And then what are they confused about? Are they confused about cars? Are they confused about buildings? Are they confused about roads? Or in the human being, are they confused about optic nerves or kidneys or skin or joints? So that if you have a certain type of cell confused about your joints, you have rheumatoid arthritis. If you have a certain type of cell confused about your small intestine, you have celiac disease. If you have a certain type of cell confused about your optic nerves, your brain and spinal cord, you might have anti-MOG associated disorder. And so if we look at the world of tolerance, there are already trials underway in certain autoimmune diseases to induce tolerance. There's one that's been going on in celiac disease with very impressive results. So tolerance studies are here. What we have to do as a community of clinicians and scientists and patients and families is get those with the different platforms around tolerance to take an interest and to target anti-MOG associated disorder to apply their, their technology to. Because there are all those different immune mediated diseases to choose from. It's, I can't argue that it's morally uh, wrong to cure rheumatoid arthritis. These patients are suffering. We have to organize in a way that gets companies to make the investment in anti-MOG associated disorder to be the beneficiary of those technologies. I think it's something we're going to see over the next several years, and I don't mean 10, I mean sub five. I think we're going to be hearing about therapies around tolerance uh, targeting anti-MOG associated disorder in one way or another over these several years. There's a lot of effort being made to put anti-MOG associated disorder and a couple related conditions uh, squarely on the map to be targeted by these technologies. Thank you for that um, answer, doctor. Uh, this next one, I'm actually gonna ask you to help me out on this. I'm gonna try to pronounce this to the best of my ability for this next question. Uh, we, we understand that rizanaleximab, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, which is currently in clinical trials, acts as an FCRN receptor inhibitor that works to stop antibody recycling in the immune system. Is there any possibility that the same mechanism can be developed to target the MOG antibody solely? Um, yes, and uh, what it takes is a tailoring of a non-specific therapy to be specific, and that's essentially what we did in the UT Southwestern study. So there is a marker for antibodies uh, that tag them for destru destruction, and that's essentially what this drug does. We did a, a, a version of things where we tagged just the anti-MOG antibodies for destruction. So they utilize the same biologic process in terms of being degraded, but out of all the antibodies to choose from to degrade, there are some anti-flu antibodies, some anti-COVID antibodies, and here are the anti-MOG antibodies. And, and the cells degrading these different proteins, they're happy to degrade anything. What we want is to say, anti-MOG antibodies, you're at the front of the line. You get degraded first and completely. And that's essentially what we did in, in the mouse study. Thank you for that. Um, if we get to the point of clinical trials for any of these types of therapies, who would be eligible from a MOG, uh, MOGAD community? And will that change with the proposal of the new MOGAD uh, diagnostics criteria? Yeah, fantastic question about clinical trials. And, and what you're getting at, the technical terms we use are inclusion exclusion criteria, who qualifies to get in and who doesn't qualify to get in. One of the things that I think as a community we really should consider doing is organizing a discussion, not about the therapies, but about inclusion exclusion criteria. It's actually a detail that I think gets left to clinicians, scientists, and companies um, all too often. And the inclusion exclusion criteria are created with very scientific purposes in mind. Um, but sometimes we exclude populations where people would want to be included. I'll give you the, the, the best example I can. Almost all, almost all clinical trials for diseases that affect both adults and children start with adult trials. And the, the, the pediatric trials come much later. 
there was a push in anti aquaporin for mediated neuromyelitis optica to start breaking through that. And indeed, one of the trials, uh, one of the drugs that was tried uh, for neuromyelitis optica actually included children down to the age of 12, teenagers down to the age of 12. And it was, I think, a huge step forward for the field not to exclude pediatrics as an afterthought, but to be more aggressive with offering trials earlier on. I think that's a discussion uh, we as a, a community with patients and families need to have in terms of what makes the most sense, what risks are we willing to take, what are we uh, willing to achieve in order to try and advance the science and get an understanding of what drugs are safe and work. And so in general, what I think the trials are going to do are target individuals who've had two or more events. Uh, and the real question is going to be, is it going to start with adults only, or will it be a hybrid trial where we can include pediatric individuals under the age of 18 uh, in any form uh, at the beginning of the trial? And I, I think that's yet to be answered. Thank you. Um, we want to move on to the next section. This is a personal thing that you, I know you've been working on for quite a few years, personal project. Um, we want we know you have done we know you have done research um, in collaboration with the srna on q cell therapies for patients with transverse myelitis can we talk a little about the q cell therapy for remyelination and the current state of this type of research so the the q cell um, is a stem cell therapy where we directly inject the cells into um, tissue that's been demyelinated in this case we're directly injecting it into spinal cords of individuals who've been paralyzed from transverse myelitis. This is a phase one safety study. It's adults only. Um, and it's there to establish that both the surgical procedure to implant the cells and the cells themselves are safe uh, in human beings. What's unique about these cells is they've been grown to be what are called glial restricted precursor cells. Well, why is that important? So we've had stem cells for decades. We, we've had the ability to put stem cells into, into human beings for a long time. Putting a stem cell into a human isn't the, the really tough part. The tough part is making sure the stem cell does only what you want it to do. I think you would agree that if I were to put a cell into your spinal cord, you don't want it to turn into a tooth or liver or a kidney. You don't need a tooth in your spinal cord. You need spinal cord cells in your spinal cord. So the real science has been around how do you control these cells so that when we implant them to a human, they only do what you want them to do. And that's where these Q cells come in. All of the preclinical data suggests um, their ability to remyelinate, to grow new myelin within a central nervous system. And so we're very excited to be uh, leading the phase one study to prove that they're safe. And I think if they are proven to be safe, uh, patients who have suffered disability because of an anti-MOG antibody attack would end up being great uh, potential recipients for this type of technology, which has nothing to do with prevention, only is focused on repair. Thank you for that. On touching on the uh, specifics for a MOG, uh, MOG ad patient, is, it, is this something, um, so you, you said that it would be something uh, possible for MOGAD patients. Uh, what conditions would be ideal for this to be implemented on the nerve damage by the effects of the MOG, MOG antibody-related attacks? Yeah, in terms of the stem cells, I, I think the we have in mind uh, people who've had spinal cord events and optic nerve events, um, both uh, being great candidates um, for procedures to put in these stem cells. What the 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 three issues with stem cell therapy. Number one are is making sure the cell does what you say it's going to do and nothing else. Number two, getting it to the site of injury. And number three, making sure your own body doesn't reject those cells. Those are the three major things. So in anti mog associated disorder, a lot of my patients have suffered loss of vision because of optic nerve damage. A lot of my patients have suffered from numbness or weakness or walking difficulty due to spinal cord involvement. And we have ways to get these cells directly injected into both of those pieces of tissue, the optic nerve and the spinal cord. And so I, I think there are great opportunities in anti-MOG to use these cells moving forward. The more challenging but not impossible uh, is our patients who have had multifocal brain lesions. So brain lesions on both sides, front and back. Um, it would require a lot of different injections to get all these cells there. And so th this is where technology around new delivery systems could help us out, new ways to get the cells in. The challenge is if I just inject stem cells into a vein in your arm, 
almost none of them are going to get to the brain spinal cord or optic nerve. So the, these places that offer stem cell infusions, I, I really uh, get upset with because they may be infusing cells, but they get wiped out by the liver and wiped out by the lungs and they never actually make it to the tissue where they need to get to, which is why we circumvented this by just doing a direct injection into the cord so we know exactly where they go. Thank you for that. Um, if if it is if it is successful for MAGA patients, are there um, locations? Uh, are there located? I think I already asked that. My point. If this is successful for MAGA patients, what can patients expect as an outcome? How much functionality can a patient uh, regain? Yeah, you know, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, that's that's why we're doing the trials. I know that's not very fulfilling. I'll tell you what we learned from the animal modeling um, is. If a person's disability is due to a lack of myelin, but the, the, the neurons, the wires, the axons are still there, then we would expect for them to have significant recovery in symptoms. If a person's symptoms are caused not just by the lack of myelin, but because of damage to the actual axons themselves, I'm more pessimistic in terms of what these cells would do in terms of recovery. Thank you for that. Yeah, we know we have some people in the community that have the axion damaged. And so I can see how that the recovery would be a lot more difficult for them than the ones that have just the, the demyelination on it. Um, are there any hopes of regenerating the spinal cord brain? Uh, I guess we've already asked that uh, brain lesions or, or optic nerves. Um, I guess the, the, in, in regards to this question, are there any hopes of being able to uh, to to regenerate the axion of the spinal cord, the brain um, brain or the optic nerves? Um, th there is. There, there are scientists who, uh, I saw a presentation on this just within the last two weeks, are looking at the signals axons use to regrow. So, so um, there's an important detail that may blow some people's minds, but it's, it's an important detail. So um, you, you have a cell in your body, you actually have millions of cells in your body, that are really, really, really long. So, so I'm just over six feet tall, I'm six one. So I have a neuron that starts in my head and goes all the way down, projects all the way down my spinal cord to the middle of my back. So it's essentially three feet long, one cell, three feet long. The, the computer uh, control for that cell is in the brain and then it sends that long axon out. If the axon gets damaged here, Everything else is fine. The axon just got damaged here. It turns out those axons do a horrible job of regrowing. They have no idea of where to go and how to get there. And a scar forms at the point of the injury, preventing any growth. And because of that, the cell just dies because it doesn't have its function anymore. So there are groups looking at ways to prevent the scar from forming or to get rid of the scar so that the axon can start to grow back to where it was. And this is going to take time. We are definitely at the cellular stage of this, um, but it's happening. But I do want to impress upon people that the regrowth of neurons is not the only way to functional recovery. In, in fact, we do not need all of our neurons in order to be fully functional. One of the things we are very interested in is in the role of plasticity to take over function. What that means is, let's say I had uh, 100,000 cells controlling my big thumb and I lose half of them. So I only have 50,000 left. Can I get those 50,000 to move my thumb fully and take over the job of 100,000. That's the notion of plasticity. And there is a lot of work being done to push the envelope of plasticity. So two different strategies to restore function, regrow the neurons or forget them, just make use of the ones you have. And both of those research strategies are being pursued in earnest. Thank you for that. Staying on the uh, stem cell treatments, uh, we have a community question. When it comes to stem cell therapies out there, should patients try full replacement? I guess they're referring to things like uh, HSCT as an example from MAGAD. 
Yeah, so so great question. And let's separate out stem cells into two categories um, because this is a source of a lot of confusion. So the HSCT, the homatopoietic stem cell transplants, are not for repair. So most of the time when people come to my clinic and they say, I'm interested in stem cell therapy, what most people are envisioning is I inject a cell that repairs the damage that's been done. There is a completely separate group of stem cell therapies so HSCT, hematopoietic stem cell transplants, to replace a person's bone marrow, which doesn't do anything to repair the optic nerve, brain, or spinal cord, nothing, but it is used to prevent attacks. Remember when we were talking a moment ago about central tolerance and peripheral tolerance? A hematopoietic stem cell transplant, a bone marrow transplant, is one way to deal with central tolerance, to essentially cure the autoimmune portion of the disease, to get rid of those confused cells and never grow them again. And it has worked in multiple autoimmune diseases. So if somebody came to me and said, Dr. Greenberg, I want to do a bone marrow transplant to prevent disease. Absolutely, we should talk about it. What are the pros, cons? What do we know? What's the safety? What are the risks? But if somebody comes to me and says, Dr. Greenberg, I want to do a bone marrow transplant to get my vision back, I say, that's not the right stem cell therapy for you. The, the stem cell therapy you need is a reparative stem cell, and that's what we're working on in trials. So two totally different stem cell therapies for di very different reasons and indications. Thank you. Um, we're going to stay on the topic. Um, and another community question regarding stem cells. Um, a parent uh, uh, banked his daughter's uh, core blood um, at birth. Are these any? Um, are there any applications of these banked stem cells for the MOG cure? Um, for the MOG cure as opposed to the use of repairing damage caused by MOG? Yeah, not yet, but stay tuned. So the, the source of cells that we would use in various approaches to stem cell therapy, whether it's the bone marrow transplant side or restorative, there is a chance that they can make use of banked cord blood. Um, admittedly, most of the strategies today are using other cell sources, but I expect for there to be more interest in those banked cord blood cells over uh, the next several years. Thank you for that. Uh, we're gonna move on now to uh, patient involvement. Uh, what can patients do to help further the efforts in these areas? Um, so I'm gonna be very careful with my answer because I'm very biased and, and, and Peter, I'm gonna own my bias up front. I'm gonna tell you what my bias is. And so everyone can stop listening after I tell my bias. I'm a clinician scientist, so I take care of patients, I, I work with families, um, and it's a very gratifying part of my career. I'm also a scientist and a researcher where, frankly, I am trying to be smarter next year than I am this year. There is no path to a cure. There is no path to improve treatments that does not involve massive engagement of patients and families in the research apparatus. And, and what I think, if I'm being blunt, a lot of people miss is the importance of filling out those annoying surveys you get from organizations and researchers, the quality of life surveys, the functional surveys, the epidemiologic surveys, the what did you have for lunch before your attack survey, uh, all these different things we ask that take your time and effort and are frankly kind of annoying. You have to clear off an hour and sit there and answer these questions. And I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. So you have to go look it up. I cannot overstress how important those efforts are for two reasons. One is obvious. The more you tell us about your experience, the better we're going to be at providing care. Very important. But there is another reason that doesn't get discussed. And that is the more organized and engaged a patient community is. So if, if a patient organization can say 90% of our participants respond to surveys, 95% show up at meetings, th this group does education, that's what attracts industry to apply their technology to patient groups. When they get ready to do a clinical trial, they wanna recruit as fast as they can. Just being blunt, time is money. So if it takes them a year to recruit patients, they go through tens of millions of dollars. If it takes them two months to recruit, they save a lot of money and it's easier to do the trial. So the more re responsive a community is to all those silly questionnaires, 
It allows the community organizations to stand up and say, look at us, we're organized, we're engaged, our patients and families are ready to go. And that's when really big investments and treatments opportunities happen. And so uh, what I would say is stay involved, answer the surveys, take part in observational studies. If there's an opportunity to give a blood sample and you're wearing and, and you're willing, give the blood sample. Um, anything you can do observationally goes a long way to getting new interventions. Staying on that note, what, what can we do as an advocacy organization to get MOGAD uh, on this track? Like, what can we do as an advocacy to also help with the patients, um, not just from a patient's perspective, from an advocacy group? Yeah, I think it's along those lines of um, engagement and, and documenting that engagement and receptiveness and getting out ahead of these discussions about inclusion exclusion criteria, what people are willing to do in the clinical trial, um, supporting uh, patient and family efforts on the logistical side you know, from a resources. So I have families who travel from quite a distance to see me uh, and organizations have helped them arrange uh, stays at the Ronald McDonald House or elsewhere. There are lots of support functions that organizations can do. And one thing that I give credit to um, uh, the MOG Association for is collaborative work with patient organizations that are in similar uh, areas. Uh, there have been uh, collaborative efforts between uh, the, the MOG Association and the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association, the Guthy Jackson Association, uh, Samara Foundation. And while each of these organizations has a mission and there's overlap between them, showing that collaboration goes a long way again to getting those um, uh, biotech companies who have to make a decision. Do I wanna try and cure MOG or rheumatoid arthritis? Lots of people suffering from both. The more organizations re reduce the barriers to those clinical trials and reduce the barriers to patient engagement uh, and are more organized in terms of patients getting to centers and getting the care, the higher on the list that disease goes for getting that investment. So engagement in organization they, goes a long way. Education is great, community engagement is great for support purposes, but what we don't talk about is it also puts you on the map for where investments should be made. Thank you for that. Yeah, we've done a lot of uh, collaborative projects over the years. So wow. I'm glad that, that that's showing that we're, we're, you know, we're in the right direction and heading down the right road with all that. Um, how does it help researchers to have a uh, registry for MOGAD patient data? So registries. So the, the definition of a registry is when patients and families share um, information about themselves in an organized fashion. Uh, it, it's a person raising their hand to say, I have anti-MOG associated disorder, or raising their hand to say, I'm the father of a patient of an anti-MOG associated disorder individual. And raising your hand and being listed is extremely important. I, I cannot stress this enough. Knowing how many people are out there who are willing to share their information is important. Having a network through that registry where if I go to the lab and discover that uh, eating Brussels sprouts was a risk factor for the disease and I have a theory about it and being able to go to people on a registry and say, hey, how many people here ate Brussels sprouts and get answers in a, in a real time fashion because people are engaged in that collective information, it, it is incredibly valuable. And so, um, the, the association working, working collaboration with others to have organized efforts to collect that data is great. Um, I, from the flip side, because I've been a survey recipient myself, uh, we never seem to have time to answer the questions. We got a lot going on. We got jobs and families and tomorrow's Valentine's. And if you didn't get a card for your loved one, you need to go do it. And there's a lot going on to have that 20 minute survey in your inbox and your email just gets pushed down and down and down. It is extraordinarily worth it uh, to answer those surveys. I, I just, um, we are so grateful of the time people take to do it. And I, I need people to understand how meaningful that contribution is. Um, uh, and so I highly encourage people, if they're willing and able, to take the time to fill out the registry surveys. And then as new questions come up, please answer them. They go a long way. 
Well, unfortunately, my kids don't eat Brussels sprouts, so that's a that's probably a good thing. <laughs> so, uh, and, and to be clear, Brussels sprouts are great for I you. I, I just I picked something uh, you know not controversial. Uh, I know I was just making a joke about <laughs> it. <laughs> the kids don't eat Brussels sprouts; they can't get them to eat their vegetables. But uh, is there any uh, any need for a biorepository? Can you tell us a little bit about how researchers involve patients and collect important data from them? So I, again, I need to tell you about a bias. So I direct our neuroimmunology biorepository at UT Southwestern, and I, I've done this now for uh, 14 years, uh, 13, 14 years. Um, a biorepository is a collection of samples that is connected to data. So we need to know about the person the sample came from. But it is incredibly useful for the development and testing of new therapies and for the development and testing of new clinical trials. Um, I, I, again, can't overstate how valuable that is, but there, there are a couple of caveats to that. So, and, and I will say that that drug that we've worked on developing that selectively gets rid of anti-MOG antibodies, we could have never done it without patient samples. Wouldn't, wouldn't be an option without patient samples. We had pay, samples from individuals with anti-MOG associated disorder, and we needed them to show that the drug would work. And so I, it, it really is an incredible resource. There is an important need at a community level um, to recognize how important engagement with new families uh, is to both the community and, and the science. So when I walk into a room with a family whose child has just been diagnosed with anti associated disorder, and it's often you know, in the hospital and they're in their first event of myelitis or ADEM or optic neuritis, appropriately, the family's concern is only on the health and well-being of their child. And that is all they should be concerned about. It is, it is not okay to ask them to be worried about anything else. Simultaneously, though, the sample from those patients at the very beginning of their journey, scientifically, is extremely valuable. Because it's the immune system unadulterated by years of therapy or other things. We have found that when patient advocacy organizations have connected with newly diagnosed families and talk about the importance of research, it resonates differently with families than when I talk about it. And so if you, no matter if you're newly diagnosed or five years in to your anti mog associated disorder, if you have the opportunity to donate to a biobank, it is an incredible gift you can give. If you make a connection on Facebook or Twitter, with a family who is in the throes of their first event, and they are willing to talk to you about a research opportunity to share samples with a biobank, uh, hearing it from you goes a long way. And so recognize that those samples are valuable, recognize the opportunities to donate are um, incredibly helpful, uh, and also recognize your ability to communicate those needs to those who just enter your community is an incredible opportunity to help raise awareness for individuals who aren't going to be thinking about that and admittedly shouldn't be thinking about that yet. But unfortunately, there's a need to think about it early on. Thank you for that. Staying on the same topic, this is a question from the community. Uh, going back to surveys, actually. Um, this patient, uh, they've been reluctant to do uh, surveys uh, because their, their daughter has been stable for three years. Should they be filling out surveys if, if stable? Yes, I love this question. So, so please send whoever sent the question in feedback with huge thumbs up. Um, oh my gosh, I should I should have said it at the beginning. Yes. So, so imagine a world where you have ten people who've been diagnosed with the disease, and and eight of them do really well, and they have no issues whatsoever. Two of them don't, and those two keep answering the surveys but the eight who did really well don't. We are going to miss the important data for why did you do well? So it's a, called a responder bias. And if we do not get data from individuals doing well, we're never gonna figure out why they did well. And so um, the, the hardest thing, and, and again, I love this question, is um, when I go to uh, patient meetings or support groups or anything along those lines, eight times out of 10, the people who are engaged are still dealing with ongoing issues. 
And the people who have fully recovered and are doing well are out, you know, doing other things because it's not on their mind. We really need engagement from those individuals. And so please fill out those surveys and raise the awareness to any of your community members who've done exceedingly well. We need their data desperately to understand this condition. It's a great question. Uh, another question from the community. We're going to uh, we're going to ask a few community questions before we move on. Um, this patient had a first episode of TM, um, then tested negative for NMO and uh, had an additional um, ended up testing positive for MOG and ended up having 11 cases of optic neuritis after being diagnosed. Uh, no other TM episodes since then. Does this person uh, believe uh, what are the chances of them having another TM episode? Are they any different now than when? Uh, are there any different, uh, what are the chances of them having another TM episode with the first episode being uh, TM and then the last 11 episodes being optic neuritis? Yeah, this, this is a question we get uh, frequently and we're still trying to answer. It's basically, uh, imagine going to a roulette wheel and it, it hit the, a red number first and then eight uh, black numbers in a row. What are the odds it's going to be a red number next? It's still 50-50 in terms of the number. So we don't necessarily think for the most part that um, which organs uh, getting affected predicts what the next event could be. Now, um, in anti mog associated disorder, there is an exception to that, and that's throughout the pediatric age range. It is true that based <clears throat> on a child's age, there is a higher rate of different attacks. So <clears throat> for children below the age of six, we most commonly see ADEM. For children who are 7 to 12 years of age, it's optic neuritis and bilateral optic neuritis. In 12 to 18, we see a lot more myelitis. And that, that's just rough numbers. Any child can have any event. When we get to the adult side, it's all over the map between optic neuritis and transverse myelitis with slightly more optic neuritis than transverse myelitis. But the past doesn't necessarily predict the future. Hey, um, this is going to be a two-part question. This is also from the community. Um, this patient lives out in a rural area uh, uh, where doctors don't seem to really know anything about MOG, which uh, isn't good for that person. Who, who are they supposed to talk to being out in these rural areas? And on the second part of that question, how can we, in your opinion, work to find positions for patients in areas of need and get them to the experts for care, like uh, we as an advocacy group, we as an organization? Yeah, uh, so somebody's going to accuse me of having plants in the Facebook audience because these are these are some of my favorite questions. Uh, I appreciate everyone who's sending in these questions. Um, I, I'm going to say something a little controversial. Uh, you actually don't need to have a MOG expert as your neurologist or primary care physician if you're living far away from a center. What you need is a physician who's willing to engage with a MOG expert. And as long as there's a willingness to communicate, there are lots of us in the field who are willing to work collaboratively with individuals. I have patients who receive their care in multiple states, and I'm either on the phone or emailing with their physician locally based on what we would do next relative to care. So as long as you have an accessible, caring, attentive healthcare provider who's willing to collaborate, you're, you're, you're golden. I had a patient of mine uh, just a state away who had a new event uh, just in the last couple of weeks. And it was the ER physician who was calling and texting me. We stayed in contact all weekend as he was managing this acute attack with multiple visits back and forth to his ER for three days, getting MRIs, getting testing done. And it, the patient received outstanding care uh, and wasn't even seeing a neurologist. And so if you're in a rural area, um, find a, a healthcare provider who meets those attributes. Now, what can the organization do to, to help this? <clears throat> and so there are models out there in terms of um, uh, connecting healthcare providers with experts. And, and we do this with anti-MOG associated disorder. We do it with the SRNA and NMO. There, there's a, a sizable group of us who are willing to collaborate with healthcare providers and do it all the time. And so one thing the MOG Association can do is identify healthcare providers who are willing to do that. So meaning, let's say one of your members in rural West Texas, I'll pick on my own state, uh, says, listen, there's nobody here, there's nobody in Midland or Odessa, Texas, 
who knows anti-mago associated disorder. But my primary care doctor is awesome. And he talks with Dr. Greenberg or Dr. Levy or Dr. Pardo or any of us in the country on a regular basis. And I've been very happy with my doctor in Midland. You should list the doctor in Midland as a uh, MOG friendly physician, uh, meaning they're willing to engage and have the conversations. They don't need to have uh, done extensive studies or research. They just need to be willing to collaborate. And that list, whether it's primary care providers or neurologists, doesn't matter what their background is, if they're willing to collaborate, uh, that's what you need. Thank you for that. Um, another thing too, doctor, is uh, I know we talked. Uh, I know you may have touched on this a little bit, but I know this question came up uh, several times in the um, in the chat. Uh, can you just touch on us real quick? Reverse vaccines that work in mice to permanently eliminate the MOG antibody. Do you, uh, can you tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah. So again, it's lots of different strategies to um, try and get rid of the antibody. So uh, the, the strategy I discussed was around degrading already formed antibodies. Another approach is to inject something, in, in this case, into mice to get them to prevent, to prevent them from making the antibody. Um, and so there have been strategies that have been used in, in labs where you can selectively get the parts of the immune system called B cells who are producing these anti-mog antibodies to stop making them. So, so a vaccine induces an antibody response, a reverse vaccine inhibits a specific antibody response. And there's a multitude of technologies being attempted to achieve just that. Thank you for that. Uh, a few more community questions and then we're gonna move on. Um, why do uh, this from uh, the community? Why do B cell depleting strategies, uh, IL six strategies, etc., work for some but not for others? Uh, does this mean there is more than uh, one type of antimog with the different mechanisms? Yeah, again, spectacular question. Um, the notion of responder non responder to a therapy um, occurs for one of uh, two reasons. Uh, either we were giving the right treatment, but dosed it incorrectly. Maybe we needed a higher dose or different dosing and just didn't know it. Or that therapy just doesn't work for that individual with the condition. And it, it gets to the, the questioner's point of, are there different versions of anti-MOG associated disorder? And I, I think to a degree there, there absolutely are. Um, so we know that there are some individuals with anti-MOG associated disorder who will have a single event uh, and then not have subsequent events. Uh, and then there are individuals who have recurrent events. Those are different individuals, different conditions. And so by definition, there are going to be different responses to therapies. What we all want for this is personalized medicine. We want to be able to um, uh, understand an individual's pathology, an individual's abnormal biology, and tailor a therapy to that. Uh, we're not there yet, but I think that's where we're headed. And then, um, what are your thoughts uh, on MOGAD overlap with other existing autoimmune diseases and on the probability of inheritable uh, susceptibility? So we have not seen our, so far, our anti-MOG associated disorder patients have clinically significant other autoimmune diseases to the same rate we do in neuromyelitis optica, for example, where there's a higher rate of people who may have lupus or Sjogren's. And so we, we're not seeing it so much. Uh, we're in the early stages. And so I reserve the right to be wrong and to uh, come back and give you a different uh, answer in the future. But right now, we're not seeing a lot of overlap with other autoimmune conditions, at least to the same degree as other diseases. In terms of heritability, um, I do not think this is gonna be a genetic disorder where you pass it down to your children. Um, I think what we find for all autoimmune diseases is that there are genetic risk factors for developing them, but you could have those genes and never get the disease. Best example is so identical twins, exact same genes, one person may get anti-MOG associated disorder, the other won't. So we know it isn't a one-to-one -one genetic disease and genetics probably play a partial role uh, in who develops this disease, but um, not enough of a role, in my opinion, for people to change their family planning. So um, 
uh, for my patients who have uh, anti mog associated disorder who want to start a family, I say the risk to your child, a future child of having anti mog associated disorders is so small, go for it. Um, that there isn't a, a big enough concern there to change your plans. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next section, which is like the future of your research at UT Southwestern. Tell us about, uh, tell us what research has been uh, happening at your laboratory at UT Southwestern for MOGAD. What areas of research do you consider the most potentially impactful? So, um, as I said, I lead our biorepository effort, in, and I've worked with a number of uh, biologists and researchers at UT on different projects related to autoimmune disease of the central nervous system. My closest collaborator here uh, is a B cell biologist by the name of Dr. Nancy Munson. Um, she and I had worked on looking at patients with transverse myelitis and their immunoprofiles to see what part of the immune system had uh, become abnormal. And over the last 10 years, um, a lot of the research has focused on being able to pick out the B cells at a single cell, le a single cell level that are making the abnormal antibodies. And we've spent a, a lot of time working with samples from our patients. Thank you all very much. Uh, you know who you are. We appreciate the contributions to look for the patterns of why did some B cells develop this autoantibody. And then uh, from that, try to develop new ways to intervene. And so we, we've learned a lot. There's still a lot to learn on how um, to characterize individuals um, who have had a derangement in their immune system. And we're working on trying to sort out uh, markers for who is going to have more severe disease versus not. So currently, we're working on ways to try and decide for those individuals who are going to have recurrent attacks versus not, can we predict who they are? We're not there yet. Thank you for that. I know today we've touched on a lot of different treatments, a lot of things coming down the pipeline. Are there any other treatments being looked at that we haven't discussed by chance? So there uh, is active interest in therapies that not just target antibodies, um, uh, but there are therapies being looked at that change B cell biology. There are therapies that are being looked at that change the, the signaling between immune cells that get them activated. So instead of killing a cell or getting rid of an antibody, can we just turn off the signal that gets that antibody producing cell revved up? Um, so I, I guess what I would say to the community is there is an intense amount of interest in developing new uh, therapies for anti-MOG associated disorder. Um, and uh, this is a good problem to have, having a lot of interest, but the time is right, the time is perfect uh, for the community to do what it's doing and organize uh, in such a way that when the clinical trials expand and launch, we already have some, there's going to be more, that the community is ready to receive them and engage with them and enroll in them so that we can as quickly as possible figure out what are going to be the best therapies for our patients and our loved ones uh, who are suffering with this condition. We're going to be in a very different world for this uh, disease uh, three to five years from now. And we're going to be in a drastically different universe for this disease uh, 10 years from now, in, in a good way. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to take one more question from the community. Is cell-based assay the best test for anti-MOG relapses, flares? Is there more accurate or sensitive to MOGAD testing than the LP, MRI, or blood tests, um, or a combination of all of these tests? So in terms of determining if you have the antibody and what level of antibody you have, the cell-based assay is absolutely the most sensitive. And the cell-based assay from the blood is the most important, not the spinal fluid. And so if you're being tested for these, this disease, your blood should be sent for the cell-based assay. When looking for evidence of a relapse, um, we rely heavily on imaging. Um, well, we rely heavily on our patients to tell us is something different. That's the most important thing. And if somebody has a concern that they're having a relapse, we rely on imaging, including MRI and an eye test called OCT uh, to look for evidence of optic nerve involvement. So if you're testing for, do you have the antibody or not? Cell-based assay. If you're testing for, am I having a relapse or not? MRI and OCT are the tools we use. 
Thank you. Um, uh, last question. Is there anything you want to pass? It's going to be a two-part question. Is there anything you want to pass on to the MOGAD patients about your hope for a cure um, or remission for the dis this disease and any other way patients can support your research? So on the, the first point, we, we absolutely are going to have a cure for this disease. I have zero doubt. I literally have zero doubt that this is a curable disease. Um, and in fact, more curable than a lot of other diseases. So uh, it is coming. It's not a matter of if, it's the how and when. What's going to be the best avenue? Because I actually think there's going to be more than one way to cure this, strangely enough. And it's really going to be a decision of what's the lowest risk intervention to get to that cure and the, the durability of that cure. So this is absolutely going to be cured. I, I really have no doubt. Um, in terms of what people can do to support this, I, I, you know, I, again, I really stress the engagement side of things. And it's, you know, when politicians go out and they, they're getting closer to election day, you know, they really push for, it's not, in, it's not just enough for you to vote. You got to bring your friends along with you. So for everyone listening, I, I'm so thankful that you're listening. I'm so thankful you're engaged. You're the tip of the iceberg. You need to go find other families and other patients and convince them to be engaged as well. The bigger the community and the more engaged those numbers are, it has a snowball effect for opening a lot of doors. And so it, it really is a matter of bringing your family, bringing your friends, finding every MOG patient you can and getting them to engage because uh, that vibrant community makes a difference. And if anybody wins the Powerball in you know the next month, uh, I can have you talk to our development office at, at UT Southwestern uh, and obviously supporting uh, the Anti-Mog Association. Um, we always joke about uh, money. It's important to fundraise, and I, I don't want to joke about it at all. Uh, all of the organizations uh, use funds to wisely support uh, different activities, but it's not about the money. Uh, there's a lot people can do by just answering those surveys, engaging, and showing up. Well, if I win the Powerball, I'll definitely make a means to try to make some donations, some some very large donations to. Yeah, the we're media. right there with we're right there with you. <laughs> um, we would like to thank Dr. Greenberg for his time and commitment to the Mog Mogai community. As we mentioned earlier, you can join the SRNA SRNA re registry by visiting uh, wearesrna.org backslash shaping the uh, dash the fu the dash future backslash research backslash SRNA registry. Um, we will have a link available on this video once uh, released. It is uh, it on our YouTube channels as well. You can also visit us at the mo at mongproject.org. Thank you for your, for this discussion and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Greenberg. Thank you.